Since 1983, fame has helped business and education work for Maine. Contact the authority, the finance authority of Maine. Welcome. This is our Afterthought segment where we keep our guests around for a little extended discussion. Uh, this week we had with us Bill Karen, who's the president and CEO of Maine Health. Uh, and we're, thanks for sticking around. We're going You're to welcome. spend a little more time. Uh, we had a good uh, session on our broadcast show. Uh, we covered a lot of topics, but this, this, this issue is uh, healthcare is so big we can't get to them all, of course. So I uh, definitely want to follow up on some things we talked about and then cover some new areas, too. Uh, one thing I didn't get to uh, in the interview on, on the air was um, we did talk about doctors and recruiting. Uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, that issue of uh, they come in pairs, These, and that's, all, that's a problem, bringing in the spouses or their partners to be able to say, you know, how do, where do they come in, too? And then also I want you to talk about, I didn't get to talk about nurses right. and nursing programs and do we have a real shortage? And if everybody needs a job, why aren't we just training nurses like crazy? Okay, go well, ahead. The, uh it's uh, the issue of recruiting physicians, whether it's a male or a female. There is always, right. uh, generally, there's a spouse or a significant other, yep. and, and it becomes a challenge in some cases, uh, particularly in smaller communities. Um, if the spouse is a professional looking for an opportunity within his or her community as they're coming with their physician um, spouse, it's sometimes very difficult to match those two up. And, and we lose some candidates from mm -hmm. time to time because of that, and uh, that's just sort of the nature of who we are as a state. Right. Um, and once again, especially kind of north of Augusta? Yeah, it, the more rural yeah. our area is, yeah. the more difficult it yeah. is when you're trying to recruit a, a professional couple. Right. But, but, you know, I, I think that works in both healthcare and non-healthcare. It does. Um, a nursing perspective, uh, we absolutely have a nursing shortage, and, and it's a shortage that is going to get worse, significantly worse over time. Um, it's being muted right now in that uh, because of the economy, we see a lot of um, nurses that wouldn't be working normally that have jumped back into the workforce because they are the only wage earner in the family at this point. And so they're not needing to go through a whole training program. They've already got it. They may need to recertify or something so like that. So today, I can tell you, in a weakened economy, the nurse shortage is not negatively impacting us. But what we've done as a health system is we've projected out our nurse workforce needs uh, through the year 2025. And I can tell you, it gets very significant in the next five or six years mm -hmm. where the, the age of our population, our nursing population, just gets to the point where we see significant retirements. And as you mentioned earlier, the, the difficulty we have is that we're not training enough nurses here in the state of Maine. And when you look at the barriers, when you ask the colleges and the universities, mm -hmm. well, why can't we train more nurses? Uh, when we know there are a couple hundred nurses every year, or a couple hundred students looking to become right. nurses, that can't get into a program, the issue becomes the, the, the need to fund the programs in the first place. Uh, we are struggling with having the teachers for those programs. Yeah, Good news is last week we, we got a uh, $4.8 million stimulus grant, Department of Labor Good. and a coalition that was put together. Purpose of that grant was to begin to spend dollars towards uh, getting those trainers so that we can commit those okay. them to the training programs as well as providing financial incentives for our current nurses to seek advanced degrees mm -hmm. and to move up the line in terms of their education. Okay. Uh, speaking of stimulus money, are, are there other parts of the stimulus money that's uh, uh, now that the Maine healthcare or Maine's healthcare industry should receive 11.5 million, I think, come from from stimulus? Yeah. Is that coming in? And for what mm -hmm. kinds of things? And is it? Are you starting to feel it? The the 11 the 11.5 11 that I think you're referencing, yeah. uh, 4.8 million of it was that nursing okay. training. Department of Labor training grant. The other six million plus number uh, relates to the state's health info net uh, okay. uh, program, which is an attempt to put together a statewide single patient record, mm -hmm. and so that'll be very helpful to us. Um, the, the, you know, when you talk about stimulus money, the real impact that stimulus money has had in the state of Maine is uh, it was a it was a huge number, several hundred million dollars that was used last year to uh, balance a budget and to right. uh, pay hospitals for right. the past amounts that were due to them. Right. So, that was that uh, Medicaid so it's been very helpful as those Medicaid dollars have flow, flown into the state. Right. But um, you know, the issue is what do you do when those dollars aren't there? Right, exactly. Hey, I wanted to follow up on that health info net piece too, since sure. you mentioned that. Um, that's a big part of uh, it gets lost sometimes in the, in the bigger debate about health care reform, but that electronic medical records, those kinds of things. Um, is that... Uh, how important is that? I mean, the supporter of the, the approach that we're, we've undertaken statewide as well as in our system. And we, we need to evolve our health care system to the point where 
every individual in this state has a single medical record that's electronically based so that if you walk into a facility in Rockland, mm -hmm. you know that information for services that you may have been provided in Bangor, Portland, or Lewiston is in that record. If, if we can get ourselves to the point where we have a complete record where images, diagnostic testing, and everything is captured, we think it'll have a significant savings in that it, it will reduce duplication of testing. Today, when, when, when a patient is seen in a rural area, too often when they go to a tertiary center, testing is repeated because the test wasn't done the way that the, the person in Portland needs it, or it's not transferred, it's not readable. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about national health care reform. Let's get you to weigh in on that too. I mean, uh, the issue of national health care reform and insurance reform, I guess maybe they're the same thing. I get confused myself about it. Uh, where do you think we are with that? Where do you think it's going to go? Um, and how important is it to, to Maine? Let me start with the end. I, okay. uh, we, we need national health reform. I, you know, we're getting to the point where health care and the way it's financed is mm -hmm. becoming unaffordable to the average person, mm -hmm. particularly in this state. And as we saw when the state tried to reform health care through the Derigo program, it's very difficult for a state like the state of Maine and its economic base to reform health care. It, it's really an issue that needs to be addressed nationally. Okay. So within that context, that says that health care reform is very important to the state of Maine. Is it because of uh, economies of scale kinds of issues? It's the economy. It's the economy. Okay. You can't, so Dirigo couldn't work? Yeah, Dir the, the problem Dirigo had was you, we were trying to improve, we're trying to improve access to a large population, a population in a state with uh, very low income, and we're trying to do it off an economic base that just doesn't exist. But what about it's the savings? That came from that year ago. I mean, just in fact, just what, yesterday, the day before, announced the next round of saving about $80 million this last year. Right. Are those real? Somewhat, somewhat. Okay. I, you know, there, there, there are savings related to year ago. The, the difficulty that we've I mean, had savings is, to, the is, whole system, is yeah. to quantify what those savings were. And, yeah. and what's happened is parties have disagreed, and it's that disagreement that has led us to a, a, an argument, lawsuits and things that right. have really not been productive. But, right. Um, we, we, we've been stuck on Derigo, and but we, we really just don't have the economic base to drive the agenda that Governor Bodacci yep. and Trish Riley had yep. around improving access. So clearly, uh, and I agree with you that doing it at the state level, noble effort, and what has to, and you have to take that effort. But clearly, at a national level, that seems to be part of the issue. Are we going to make it? Are we going to get there? I mean, you've got. I mean, I bet you talk to people in Washington who really know what's going on. Tell what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, so then we, we move it to the national yeah. platform, which is where it needs to be. And right now, it's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess in that um, you know it's become an issue that's been very politicized. Uh, it's one where we have very little bipartisan conversation occurring. Um, we we now have a bill, the Senate bill, which is the most likely mm -hmm. one to to be passed if anything is passed. And uh, getting consensus around that bill is very difficult. It's it's not understood. Uh, we went through a period of time where in order to secure the votes that were needed, there were certain deals cut with states, so it became a very expensive right. bill. Right. Um, and the reality is we, nobody has really been, taken the time or had the time to sit down and say, what can we do? Uh, if the question is, you know, where do I think we're going to go, mm -hmm. I, I do not think we'll end up with the comprehensive right. health care reform that President Obama and, and the Democratic Party tried to put in place. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're more likely to have some incremental reform um, only because people have to agree at some point to do something. Mm -hmm. we, we, the answer of not doing anything probably isn't acceptable. Well, I mean, uh, the anthem rate increase. I mean, it was, I can't remember what the percent was, 23% or whatever they're requesting. Yeah. Um, and others, too, not just anthem. Um, that is, uh, what do you think about that? Is that a justifiable increase? I mean, uh, you're in the inside. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm, not in I'm, not in, I'm not in the insurance inside. Right. I don't but, do the calculations. But you know what the but, costs are and how yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a big number, and and the reason it's a big number, it's a small group market that yep. we're talking about, yep. and so it's a case where uh, Anthem has to justify in front of the superintendent that uh, that increase is justified by either increased utilization or the actual performance of mm -hmm. that's occurred in that group, uh, and so the numbers are the numbers. If if Anthem demonstrates that utilization has increased in that group and um, the, the cost of care being provided, the catastrophic care being provided, went up at those numbers, then that simply tells us that, you know, it's a formula and so it, it should flow that way. But it tells us that we've got a, a small group that mm -hmm. doesn't have enough people in it. Right. The base just isn't there. Uh, we're going to wrap for right now. Thank you again.